<clears throat> well, thank you all for coming today, and I hope that I'm going to introduce a new uh, source of information to some of you. How many of you have heard or even looked at the West Shore magazine before? One hand? <laughs> okay, no, this is good, because this, this means I'm, I'm reaching a good audience. Um, the West Shore magazine was established in Portland by a man named Leopold Samuel. And he was born in 1847 in Germany and migrated to New York and stayed there uh, as a teenager. And the way he made his living in those days was to uh, carry newspapers. He was a newspaper boy. And he handed out advertisements, handbills, if you will. And so he got into, at a very early age, he got into the advertising and promotional and news aspect of life. He eventually made his way out to California and then came up to the Portland area as a young man and decided that he would make his living as a publisher. So he did indeed publish uh, one of the first Portland city directories in the early 1870s, and he illustrated it. Not himself personally, he didn't draw pictures, but he did have illustrations in his city directory, which was a very big thing for the day. And he always uh, signed his name L. Samuel. He must not have liked his first name, so he's L. Samuel. But Samuel always thought that, well, he really bought into the theory that a picture is worth a thousand words. So the magazine that he eventually established in 1875 was called The West Shore and it was a promotional magazine. He really believed in promoting the Northwest and of course Oregon in particular, but all over the Northwest. Um, how many of you remember Governor Tom McCall of Oregon in the 1970s? Okay, one of the things that he was famous or possibly infamous for was the, uh, the catchphrase, you're welcome to visit Oregon, but by God, don't live here. <laughs> Pass through, spend your money, and then go elsewhere to live. Do not live here. Samuel was just the opposite. We have McCall in 1970s. In the 1870s, a century previous to that, Samuel was all about bringing immigrants to Oregon to live. Well, this is the first issue of Samuel's West Shore magazine. And you can see in the masthead here that Oregon and the Northwest was depicted as an open land with nothing there. It was just ripe for immigration, ripe for settling, ripe for development. Um, in these first years, because the um, reproduction process available for publication had not progressed too much, most of the illustrations were done in a woodcut style. That was what was available during the day and especially available at a reasonable price to publishers. So this, the first uh, few years worth were fairly simplistic in illustrations. And in fact, let me back up a minute here. This is a later masthead after Samuel had been publishing the magazine for a few years. And you can see how much the masthead had changed from that open, empty landscape into something that had uh, agriculture and business and just all kinds of riches waiting for the immigrant. So what I'm going to do for the rest of the show here is just in a chronological order, I've taken out several of the what I think are the interesting illustrations from the magazine. And I'm not going to talk about the stories behind the illustrations too much, except to read you small excerpts that go with the illustrations. But I want to showcase the uh, progression of the artwork that was promoted in the West Shore magazine and show you how the styles changed and also just show you the the whole gamut from soup to nuts of subjects and illustrations that Samuel was into really promote, promote, promote the Northwest. So this was um, a litho lithograph as opposed to a woodcut. Lithograph was done on stone or sometimes on metal. And that was an advance in the printing process. So in May of 1878, this was the first lithograph that was published in the West Shore magazine. And it was um, touting the new Oregon uh, steamship company, steamer 
Oregon, obviously enough. So I'll read you a little snippet here that came from an article uh, accompanying the illustration. The Iron Steamship Oregon is one of the fleet of first-class steamers running between San Francisco and Portland and is the property of the Oregon Steamship Company to whom our citizens are indebted for the many improvements affected in the traveling facilities between Oregon and the outside world. The vessel has three decks beside the hurricane deck. The spar deck is entirely of iron, the main deck is partially of iron, the deck frames are all iron, fastened in the most secure manner known in naval architecture. She has accommodations for 175 first-class passengers and 400 steerage passengers. Her interior is dazzlingly beautiful. The paneling is composed of maple, French walnut, and ebony trimmed with gold. Her upholsterings, carpets, mirrors, silver service, cutlery, glassware, and table linen are of the latest and most expensive patterns. So you probably get a feel for Samuel's language already. He was really promoting all, not just the land itself and the Northwest, but also uh, how to get here, what you can do once you do get here. So uh, promote, promote. By January of 1879, Samuel published his first tinted lithograph. Everything prior to this was in black and white. And you're saying, I know to yourself, well, this one is in black and white, isn't it? Unfortunately, I did not have the original magazine from which this illustration came, so I had to take it from a black and white microfilm. Uh, but this was tinted when it was published, and it was a three-part litho that actually folded out. It was like a centerfold for the magazine. From the time the Hudson's Bay Company first established a post here, Victoria has been the general supply point for the whole province of British Columbia. She sprang suddenly into great commercial activity in 1858 when the endless throng of miners poured into the Fraser River gold fields, 3,000 of whom wintered in and around the city. When, as the excitement abated, the greater portion of them departed and the tented city vanished like the camp of a moving army, it was demonstrated that a city had been founded which was destined to live, to grow with the province, and to become metropolitan as the resources of the surrounding region were developed. The Umatilla House at the Dalles. One of the liveliest place, business places in Oregon today is Dalles City, or as it is better known, The Dalles. It is the county seat of Wasco and has a population, as per census just returned, of 2,600. Like all other place it is, places, it has its ups and downs, but never has it been on so firm a footing as at present. The line of the Oregon Railway and Navigation Company passes along Front Street nearest the river. The company has no regular depot, but trains land passengers in front of the Umatilla House, in which its ticket office is located and where meals are served. Now, this building has been gone for decades and decades and decades, but on the right-hand side, you see that little horse-drawn vehicle there? That was the omnibus that took uh, guests at the hotel around town or possibly down to the river or whatever. That omnibus still exists. So if you are ever passing through the Dalles, stop in at the Fort Dalles Museum and you can see that little brown and yellow vehicle. Okay, I told you he covered all kinds of subjects here. In our former article on the Holsteins, we made a few general remarks upon the characteristics of the breed. At this time, we would speak especially of the Holstein cows. In them lies the value of the breed, for the Holsteins are preeminently dairy cattle. H.C. Hoffman, president of the Elmira New York Farmers Club, said that he has one cow which gave an average of 10,092 pounds of milk per year for four consecutive years. I think she was tired. The engraving which we have used to present to the eye the form of the Holstein cow represents a heifer called Minnie Winkle, worn by George, owned by George E. Brown of Illinois. Her colors, as is characteristic of the breed, are a brilliant contest of jet and snow. The Oregon uh, Railway and Navigation Steamer's Wide West. Her hull is 215 feet long and about 236 feet overall. She is of 39 feet beam, giving her great carrying capacity. Her hull is divided into 84 watertight compartments, each of which is provided with a steam siphon to discharge leakage water. She can carry about 550 tons of wheat without swashing her guards in the water. Her propelling power consists of two horizontal high-pressure engines of 28-inch bore of cylinder and 96-inch stroke with a piston. On the roof are seven lifeboats with crane derricks, which can be lowered at a moment's notice of fire. Her cost was not far from $114,000, and she is good for 10 years of future service. This um, steamship eventually made its way, after service on the Columbia, made its way up to 
the Inland Passage and whatnot, and was wrecked on Destruction Island in the Strait of Juan de Fuca in 1889. Now, this was published in 1881, but it was taken from an illustration that was done in 1860. I'm not sure if the original illustration was a drawing or a photograph, daguerreotype, whatever, but uh, the artists at the West Shore often used previous, previously taken photographs or views to create a lithograph which could be published. It was only in 1843 that the Hudson Bay Company set a party of their employees to Victoria, so-called after the reigning sovereign, where they built a fort and laid the foundation of a very important trading post. Six years later, a grant of the island was made to the company by the British government on condition that they should use their utmost endeavors to promote colonization. The same great trading corporation had possession of the mainland under a similar charter, but was used by them exclusively for their fur trade and beyond establishing forts at Victoria, Nanaimo, and Rupert, not much practical use was made of the island. Another technique that Samuel used in his magazine was to uh, showcase a certain town or area in one issue so that the bulk of one issue might have, in this case, showcased Victoria. And what better thing to do to help with the uh, financial situation at the magazine than to sell ads to Victoria businesses. He did this in many towns uh, around the Northwest, Portland, even uh, Butte and Helena, Montana, uh, so a few places down in California. So he really covered the whole Northwest. Uh, he even got up into Alaska once or twice. But this page is an illustration that one of his staff artists did of the ironworks in Victoria and then followed by ads for uh, that ironworks and associated businesses. These were other ads that were done and most of the ads in the magazine were full page ads, believe it or not, at least these, these illustrated ones. Uh, the magazine varied in size over the years at first, it was a fairly large magazine, almost a newspaper size, a folded newspaper size. And then a few years later, it switched down to roughly an 8 by 12 size, and then it varied back and forth over the years. But by and large, all of the illustrations in the magazine were full-page illustrations, had a wealth of detail in them. And as you can tell, even the ads were pretty nice looking. And I think this um, illustration is a very good example of the, the artistic techniques that the staff artist used. They chose dramatic views and they emphasized those views with, as you know, you see this dark ring around and some little filler in the edges of vines. They, on the far left there, you can see it was almost like a page was curled over. So they used a lot of interesting artistic techniques to play up um, the illustrations. The high cliffs of basaltic rock which rise abruptly in places from the bank of the Columbia River, towering far above the track which has been blasted out at its base or which is carried around its fronting front on, frowning front on trestle work, beneath which rushes the great river, are always objects of admiration. The one presented in our engraving is known as Upper Cape Horn to distinguish it from spired cliffs of that name further down on the opposite side of the stream, so well known to travelers on the river. As the train creeps along the base of these giant rocky bluffs and the eye follows their seamed and creviced front to their apex towering far above, the gazer for the first time realizes their magnitude and appreciates one of the many difficulties the engineers overcame in constructing this river line. Some of you out there know me and you know that I like stagecoaches, so I had to get a picture of a stagecoach in here. Pilot Peak is a tall spire of rock on Siskiyou Mountain, standing almost on the boundary line between Oregon and California, and but a short distance from the tunnel of the Oregon and California Railroad now being constructed. It has served as a guide and landmark to travelers ever since the first party of Hudson's Bay Company trappers crossed the mountains into California in 1828. Now, Samuel and his artists did get into Montana quite a bit. They were promoting uh, that far east, at least. The Wind River Mountains, a range of needle-pointed granite peaks, extend from the Snake River northward to the southern extremity of the National Park of the Yellowstone. They were first observed by Wilson Price Hunt in 1811 while crossing the continent to assist in establishing at Astoria the headquarters of the Pacific Fur Company. 
On that memorable journey, which was fraught with more privations and suffering than any overland passage before or since, the three culminating spires served as landmarks for many days and were called the Pilot Knobs. A few years after, the French trappers of the Hudson's Bay Company christened them the Three Tetons. And we, of course, know that whole range day is the Grand Tetons. Now, here is an illustration from one of the issues where um, Samuel was promoting, obviously, Seattle. And this was in 1884. Now, Seattle hadn't been around for about 30 years, so this is an interesting passage. Interesting as it would be to trace the history of Seattle from this infant settlement through the changing years to the sturdy, of city, to the sturdy city of today, that pleasant task must be left to the historian while we speak of topics possessing more than an antiquarian interest. The Seattle of present, in the vigor of her growth and possessing a knowledge of and trust in her illimitable resources, is a subject of deeper interest to the busy world of commerce. It is of this the capitalist, mechanic, merchant, and manufacturer would learn. So here only th roughly 30 years after Seattle was founded, they're already talking about the beginnings of the city being of antiquarian interest. Oh well. <laughs> the Tacoma Rail Yard. Tacoma is no longer a city of the future, an embryo city, the coming metropolis, or any other, any other of the many titles by which people have been accustomed to designate it. It has ceased to be the proposed terminus of an incompleted railroad and has become the actual terminus of a great overland trunk line, the only direct avenue of communication between the east and the deep waters of the Pacific Northwest. The site is both salubrious and beautiful. It rises by successive terraces to a height of 300 feet above the water's edge, rendering the drainage of its surface by natural means complete, and a thorough system of sewerage easy and practicable. Uh, more about Tacoma and the railroads. Remember that uh, Samuel was very big on railroads because they brought people and commerce and trade in. More than a year, I'm going to speak just to the upper left drawing for the moment. More than a year ago, a large iron ferry boat was ordered in New York and was constructed and shipped around the Horn in pieces, arriving early last spring. She has been put together and is ready to begin her trips. Her length is 336 feet, width of beam is 40 feet. The Tacoma, as she is named, is capable of transferring 12 passenger coaches or 27 loaded boxcars at one trip. The ferry slips are in the vicinity of Kalama, the point where the boats from Portland connect with the train for Puget Sound under the old arrangement. So in the days before they had the technology to build a bridge long enough to span the Columbia River, the trains from Portland would come up to the St. Helens area, St. Helens, Oregon that is, and then go on board this ferry. The whole train went on board a ferry. The ferry deck had railroad tracks on it. And then the ferry would come across to Kalama, where it would nose up to the dock, where there was a matching set of railroad tracks, and the train would pull off all the box cars or passenger cars and proceed up to Tacoma. So an interesting way to get around uh, not having big bridges. On this lower slide, during the year, the coal mines tributary to Tacoma forwarded to the city for shipment uh, over 168,000 tons of coal, being an increase of 200% over the output of 1882. The handling of such an enormous quantity of coal was of itself a large business, but the preparations being made for the future indicate an extensive increase. Notwithstanding the fact that coal bunkers of great capacity were constructed last year, the site for larger and more commodious ones has already been selected. Now Samuel also delved into the Native American uh, population and their artwork primarily. Samuel, as was not unusual for the time, did not think a great deal of Native Americans as far as a portion of um, American uh, culture, but he did, at least to some degree, appreciate their artwork. So I would to read you a little snippet that refers just to the upper left drawing. How many of you heard, have heard of James Gilchrist Swan? J.G. Swan, okay. He um, settled out on the coast in you know, 1851, 52, 53, somewhere in there, I don't remember exact year. But he uh, was a raconteur, a writer, he collected things for the Smithsonian, and he had a great deal to do with the Native Americans, both out on the coast and eventually up around Forks in Port Townsend. Um, so this, this little, um, description was written by him. Figure one, drawn my, by my Indian assistant, Johnny Kit Elswa, represents cirrus clouds. The center figure is Tikul, the wind spirit. 
On the right and left are his feet, which are indicated by long streaming clouds. Above are the wings, and on each side are the different winds, each designated by an eye and represented by the patches of cirrus clouds. When Takul determines which wind is to blow, he gives the word and the other winds retire. The change in the weather is usually followed by rain, which is indicated in the tears which stream from the eyes of Takul. From April to August, the Columbia River below Astoria is dotted with the white sails of fishing boats, constantly passing between the fishing grounds and the net racks and docks at the canneries. At all times of the day, these boats may be seen beating out to the bar or, com or coming in before the wind with a load of fish, though they appear in the greatest numbers just before and after the change of the tide. During the fishing season, Astoria is a busy place. At least 3,000 men are added to its population, whose wages, spent with liberality and even reckless, recklessness, swell the volume of retail trade and contribute to the support of many institutions, which, if not morally or commercially beneficial to the city, at least do their share toward making things lively. <laughs> The coastline of British Columbia is the most wonderful in the world. The mountains border closely upon the sea, the shore being indented by a multitude of bays and inlets and fringed by countless small islands, between which run tortuous but safe and navigable channels. Outside of these and protecting these inland channels for nearly the entire length of the coast are a series of large islands, the greatest and most southerly of which is that of Vancouver, on which Victoria is situated. Our engraving of the Idaho, the Alaska excursion steamer, surrounded by masses of floating ice, represents one of the phases of a trip to our northern possessions. The traveler along the Alaskan coast has all his previous ideas of the fitness of things constantly outraged. With ice surrounding his vessel, he sees the densest of green foliage on the shore, back of which rise high mountains in whose gorges lie masses of perpetual snow and ice. Everywhere nature seems fitful and eccentric in her conduct, appearing to delight in setting winter and summer together by the ears and mixing them up in a most promiscuous and confusing manner. This ship, by the way, was lost on the race rocks near Victoria in 1889, so it didn't survive this illustration for too long. Um, this also uh, points up how Samuel and his artists got illustrations. Either he or some of his artists would actually travel around. They take extensive trips, and if the artists were there, they would sketch while they were there interesting things that might uh, need promoting in the magazine. Or sometimes they would take photographs and bring a photo back to the shop and then create um, a, a lithograph from that. This to me looks like an accident, or actually several accidents waiting to happen. <laughs> a lot of business going on there. Vancouver, the terminus of the Canadian Pacific Railroad on Coal Harbor, is a lively and growing place. 50 new buildings have been erected this winter, and the town contains fully 1,000 people. Six hotels are totally inadequate to accommodate the throng of visitors and newcomers. Contracts to the amount of $50,000 have been let for clearing the town site, and the work is progressing rapidly. Fully 4,000 men, no Chinese labor being permitted by the terms of the contracts, will be at work on the town site and railroad within a few weeks. Now you'll notice here in the center, see this white line and those two little white lines? That's because this is a centerfold. The magazines were sewn together, so on these centerfolds you actually get a little piece of string that shows up. This was the first full color lithograph that Samuel was able to publish. And that was in 1886, so that was 11 years after the magazine was founded. And it was for baby carriages, of all things. Now, later on, we'll see another ad by this uh, H. Ackerman and Company. So they must have had some money, because they always purchased full-color, full-page ads. Willamette Steam Mills. The Willamette Steam Sawmills form one of the most important industries of Portland. They are situated on the west bank of the Willamette in the northern edge of the city and give employment to about 150 men. Logs from the various tributaries of the Columbia and Willamette are towed in rafts to the mill and large vessels load lumber at its docks for various ports in California, Mexico, Central America, Peru, Chile, Hawaiian Islands, Australia, and China. Large quantities of lumber are shipped eastward along the line of the Northern Pacific and Oregon short lines. The mills were built in 1871. These mills were the first to open markets for Oregon lumber east of the Rocky Mountains, thus inaugurating a movement which will doubtless prove of great benefit to this region. One of the things I like about this drawing is the amount of detail in it 
and the wonderful perspective, kind of a bird's eye perspective that really gives you a good view. Uh, there's a, a train with actually passenger cars passing through the mill yard, and I don't know if you can see them on here, but there are several signs around that say no smoking, which would have been a good thing around a lumber mill. Um, Samuel, the excerpt that I'm going to read from the accompanying article for these illustrations <clears throat> talks about the Chinese. And like the Native Americans, Samuel subscribed to the, um, the, for, the pretty much the, um, the prevailing view of the time that the Chinese were not wanted. So this is just uh, from 1886 here, what the attitude towards Chinese was. As regards the Chinese, it is the universal sentiment of all classes, rich and poor, educated and ignorant, that they are a detriment, a drag to business, a menace to free labor, and an unassimilative foreign element which can never become a part of the body politic and can never be taught to cherish and practice those great principles which form the foundation stones of Americanism. While it is desirable that the country be freed from the presence of the Chinese as quickly as it can be done by legal and proper means, no form of intimidation or violence towards them must be permitted, and they must be protected in their persons and rights of property wherever they may choose to reside. To do less than this is not only dishonorable, but is to lay up an account against ourselves which will be hard to meet when the day of reckoning shall come between China and the United States. Here, this illustration, uh, which again was a centerfold for the magazine, was from 1886. The new quarters of the West Shore, corner of 2nd and Yam Hill Streets, are now open to the inspection of its friends. The illustrations give a fair idea of the exterior of the building and the interior of the various departments. In fitting it up, the proprietor had three objects in view, neatness, convenience, and facilities for doing the best class of work. The first two were but matters of taste and a knowledge of what was needed, but to secure the latter, the best work, required the purchase of much new and expensive machinery and tools and the employment of additional high-priced labor. My theory is that first-class work requires first-class workmen and first-class tools. So here he's promoting himself. And you'll notice in the illustrations of the bindery room, which is in the, is in the center, in the composing room in the bottom right, Anybody? Yes, say that out loud. There are, women. there are women working side by side with men. So I'm not sure how unusual that was for the time, but even to get women into the illustration as workers, I think was a good thing. Um, of all the artists that Samuel employed over the years, only one or two illustrations came from women artists, and I don't have any with me today. I would really have to research that uh, a lot. Yeah. When did you say they ceased business? 1891. Yes, not too long, yep. Um, but Samuel did use women uh, and their, their talents in the magazine in other ways. Frances Fuller Victor, or some of you are familiar with that name, she was a researcher, historian, and writer. And if you've ever seen Bancroft's History of the Northwest, the two volumes for Oregon and Washington were written by Frances Fuller Victor, but Bancroft never let anyone know that. So he uh, just erased her name and said they were all by him. Uh, but Francis Fuller Victor did write some articles uh, and poetry and other things for the magazine for various issues, and also suffragists like Abigail Scott Dunaway of Portland and Ella Higginson, who was a novelist, um, also actually uh, wrote and managed featured columns for the magazine for certain years. Now, this next one is one of my favorite ads. I don't really know why, I just love it. It's a color or canning, I'm not sure, but I just think that's a great ad. This is again by Ackerman uh, Company. Uh, again, was a full page ad done in, uh, in color, and I just think it's cool. I love the fonts. The fonts are neat, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And again, so each of these illustrations were drawn specifically for that one magazine. And another thing that's important to realize about the illustrations for the West Shore is most of them, most of the original artwork is long gone. So don't go to a museum or on web and expect to find the original lithograph of this. They're long gone, they were throwaways. So these magazines with the printed ads and printed illustrations 
really are, for the most part, the only records we have of that particular illustration. So the originals are gone with the end. <coughs> this is one of my favorite illustrations. It's called Wooding Up. Steamboating has its special peculiarities on nearly every stream in the world where inland commerce is born on the bosom of the water. The snags, the ragged roustabout, and the volubly profane mate, which seem to be indispensable features of navigation on the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, are wanting on the Willamette and Columbia, much to the comfort and pleasure of travelers. This is a land of vast forests, and the firs supply the fuel for generating steam. At intervals along the stream on either side are piled great rows of cordwood, aggregating many thousand cords, and the scene depicted by the artist on page 153 is a familiar one to travelers on our riverboats. The time is approaching when steamboating on the Columbia will become of far greater importance than it ever has been in the past. I think that's just a lovely scene of days gone by. John Day Valley. I put this one up not because the illustration is so fantastic, but to show you the photo from which the engraving was made. So, and you can see how accurate that artist was. Now, I don't know who took the photo, if it was Samuel himself, or maybe if the artist traveled out to the John Day Valley uh, to take the photo, but you can match up the wheel ruts here in the foreground, uh, there's the three probably cottonwoods or something in the far back right. Uh, just an amazing amount of detail and so accurate compared to the photo. That portion of Oregon known as the John Day Valley lies in Grant County along the course of the upper portion of John Day River. John Day Valley is a tract of fertile land 70 miles long and varying from one to six miles in width. The soil is prolific and is especially adapted to wheat, barley, oats, potatoes, alfalfa, and fruit. In the valley are the towns of John Day, Prairie City, and Mount Vernon, while Canyon City, the county seat, lies but a short distance up Canyon Creek. Although the best locations have long been taken, there are still good openings for settlement here or in others of the numerous fine valleys of Grant County. This is cute. Kindergarten, the impression seems to prevail that it is a place to which parents send their children in order to be relieved of their care for a portion of the day. <laughs> but the noble women who have this work in charge are actuated by higher motives than a desire to maintain a public nursery for the convenience of tired, impatient, or unaffectionate parents. The kindergarten is a place where children are developed and made to grow morally, physically, and mentally. <clears throat> Its object is to draw out and train that which is in the child, closely following the order of nature in the line of development, seeking to give the right direction to every tender shoot of intelligence and enlist the natural activity of the child in the work of improving its health, imbibing moral ideas, developing its mental faculties, and increasing its store of knowledge. And I think that little girl up there in the upper white looks like a troublemaker. <laughs> Uh, Samuel also talked a little bit about politics. The Oregon state election will be held on Monday, the seventh day of June. Three complete state tickets are in the field, Republican, Democratic, and Prohibition. Taken all together, the political situation is much complicated. As there is no national issue to steady the ranks of the two great parties, and as the strength of the Prohibition vote is unknown, the uncertainties of an election will never be better illustrated than at the polls next Monday. On page 173 are presented portraits of the party nominees for governor. Honorable T.R. Cornelius of Washington County was nominated by the Republicans, Honorable S. Penoyer of this city by the Democrats, and Honorable J.E. Houston of Jackson County by the Prohibitionists. The interest naturally felt in citizens who have been brought so prominently before the public has prompted the West Shore to thus introduce them to its many readers. Uh, back to Native Americans again, and um, these two illustrations of Indian characteristics and types, and I'm just going to talk about Seattle, who's in the left-hand illustration. Old Seattle, as he is spoken of by the pioneer citizens of the Middle Puget Sound region, was chief of the Suquamish Indians 40 years ago, with seat of power at the Old Man House, now Port Madison, across the Sound 12 miles from the present town of Seattle. The first white man who came to the Sound after the Hudson's Bay Company employees settled at the head of the Sound at and near what are now the towns of Olympia and Tumwater. The Indians realized the advantages to be derived from the, from the proximity of white settlements, enabling them to sell their fish, game, and labor. 
and in return buy tools, guns, trinkets, etc. With an eye to these advantages, Seattle temporarily removed his place of dwelling to Olympia, and there he was found by Dr. D. S. Maynard in 1851. Maynard wanted to get further down the sound and to locate at some point favorable for trading with the Indians and for the building of a town. Seattle told him he knew a place to suit him and an arrangement was quickly made by which Dr. Maynard was taken down the sound by Seattle and his Indians in a canoe. The mountain train generally consists of from two to five wagons secured together in succession from the largest to the smallest and draw, drawn by from four to ten spans of horses or mules or both. The driver sometimes walks and sometimes rides one of the wheel animals that was the team closest to the wheels, obviously, where he can guide the leaders with the long rein and at the same time set the brakes on all the wagons by an attachment to the forwarder one within reach of his hand. Often the leaders of a mule train are decorated with a set of bells, whose constant jiggling give notice of their approach so that parties traveling the grade in an opposite direction may take warning and stop at one of the numerous turnouts, or wait-a-bits, as they used to be called. If this is not done, it may result in an awkward meeting at some point where the road is too narrow to admit of passage. Such a meeting is devoid of charm, even for the best of friends. So can you imagine running into that? You've got up to 10 uh, teams, pairs of animals, either horses or mules, and four or five wagons. That's got to be a few hundred feet long. Thousand. Thousands have admired the beauty of Multnomah Falls in the summertime who have little idea of how different they appear in winter. During the few weeks when ice forms in the Columbia Gorge, the falls present a strange but still beautiful aspect. The spray is driven by the shifting winds in all directions till every jutting point of rock for many yards around has a long pendant of ice. When the storm is over and the icy crystals glisten in the sunlight, the effect is indescribably beautiful. So even back in the 1880s, Multnomah Falls and the Columbia Gorge was uh, an important visiting point for tourists and also for people from town who just wanted to go out into nature and get away from it all for a while. 20 miles south of the entrance to the Columbia River is Tillamook Head, a bold headland of rocks reaching far out into the sea. The work of construction was a long and difficult one for the lighthouse. The steamer Corwin was in October 1879, taken as close to the rock as possible, and then with great difficulty, two men landed with a cable, which they made fast to a rock, the other end being secured to the mast of the vessel. A block and traveler were attached to this, and men and materials were landed in this way. A working party remained all winter preparing the surface of the rock for occupation. By the 1st of May, the top had been sufficiently leveled. Two large and four small derricks were then landed with infinite difficulty and the actual work of construction was begun. The work was completed and the first light exhibited on January 21st, 1881. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that lighthouse is still there. Anybody know for sure? I think it is. One of the annual events of Oregon is the fair held every September at Salem, known as the State Fair. These exhibitions are largely attended, chiefly by residents of the Willamette Valley, though great numbers come from Eastern Oregon, Southern Oregon, Northern California, and from even more remote localities. The grounds are large, enclosed by a high board fence, and are supplied with numerous large buildings for the various needs of the fair, a splendid racetrack, pens for the display of stock, and all the accessories necessary for a successful exhibition. The fair recently held was a most successful one financially. Two years ago, however, the society having become involved in debt to the extent of about $27,000, the legislature came to its relief with an appropriation of $5,000 annually for two years. Um, Clarence Smith was hired by uh, Samuel at the West Shore as an illustrator, but he also managed to slip in some cartoons or, dare we say, social commentaries once in a while. So this one probably doesn't need a whole lot of explanation and kind of an odd thing for, to celebrate Christmas, but there you go. <laughs> there was a turkey raffle, I guess he won. The Territorial Penitentiary has just been completed at a cost of about $80,000. It stands on a tract of 155 acres, which was donated to the territory for that purpose. The work was begun in June 1886 and completed in February. 
The immense wall of stone and cement encloses a parallelogram 330 feet by 396 feet. It is six feet wide at its foundation, three feet below the surface of the ground, and tapers to a width of 16 inches at the top, 15 feet above the earth. A plank walk with an iron railing encircles the wall on the outside, three feet from the top. This is for a guard walk. The cell building is 184 feet inside with cement floor and corrugated iron ceiling. It contains 84 cells and a corridor. And as you may know, when this um, territorial prison was finished, the prisoners from Bukota, or Siatko, went there instead. Mining, gold mining. The germ of hydraulic mining was a rude contrivance used near Nevada City by a miner named A. Chabot in 1852. He conducted water into his claim through 40 feet of canvas hose, directing the stream against the loose dirt after it was picked down from the bank. Great improvements in appliances have since been made. The canvas hose has been supplanted by huge pipes of boiler iron, 15 to 20 inches in diameter, and the little stream from a half-inch nozzle has developed into an almost resistless torrent issuing from an orifice 7 to 10 inches in diameter. The torrent of water rushes forth with a roar and hurls itself in an almost solid mass against the bank, which crumbles and melts away as though it were but a heap of snow. Again, back to railroads here for a couple of slides. Samuel loved railroads, as I mentioned before, because they brought so much trade and commerce and people out to the area. And, of course, would then carry, uh, carry goods back to the East Coast. The engraving of the celebrated Stony Creek trestle on the line of the Canadian Pacific Railway presents a striking example of the difficulty and expense of railroad construction in the Western Mountains. The trestle is a substantial structure, 296 feet high in the center. It is the highest viaduct of the kind in the world, being 70 feet higher than the famous trestle at Morant Gulch on the line of the Northern Pacific, a few miles from Missoula, Montana. This trestle was wood and was replaced by a steel trestle in 1894, so it didn't have too long of a lifespan. But these railroad trestles gave Samuel's artist uh, a good dramatic um, reason to have illustrations, and I think this next one is just phenomenal. This is in British Columbia. The trip from Victoria to Nanaimo and Wellington, the seat of coal mining operations, is made by the Island Railway, a distance of 70 miles. The route is a pleasant one and leads through a region of low mountains and grassy valleys, passing through forests and much of the best agricultural country of Vancouver Island. Two of the many beautiful scenes are the crossings of Nanaimo River and the crossing of Arbutus Canyon. The Island Railway, running to Nanaimo, BC, has been completed and begins operation the present month. Two trains will be run each way daily. Under the influence of this enterprise, the eastern side of Vancouver Island should advance rapidly in wealth, population, and production. And this wooden trestle, which is just, there's a lot of trees in that baby. Uh, this was built around 1887 and lasted until the early 1900s when it was replaced by a steel trestle. Harrison Hot Springs, among the many beautiful summer resorts and sanitariums of the Pacific Coast, none possesses greater attractions or offers better opportunities for the recuperation of health than Harrison Hot Springs of British Columbia. They lie on Harrison Lake in the mountains of the Coast Range, just north of the line of the Canadian Pacific. A tramway four miles in length is being constructed from Agassiz Station, which will render them easily accessible. The virtue of these waters has long been known. And from Harrison Hot Springs, a uh, spa, if you will, we go down to Seaview at the southern end of Long Beach in Washington. Near the south end of the beach is Seaview, formerly known as Stout's. The property was originally owned by J.L. Stout, who laid it off in blocks and has sold a great deal of it. A number of both large and small cottages have been built, making quite a town, which is well populated in the summer season. Mr. Stout keeps a large hotel with cottages adjacent. The beach is an excellent one and is always crowded during bathing hours. There is a large dancing pavilion near the hotel and a splendid camping ground has been prepared by Mr. Stout where all who desire may camp free of charge. Now, have any of you been down on the south end of Long Beach? 
You'll be down there. It's a beautiful little spot, and the beach really does die at the headlands. Uh, and on the other side of the headlands is, of course, the, Colum the mouth of the Columbia River. There's, and you see on the far left where that couple is walking out on a planked walk. That little walkway, the little trail out to the beach still exists. I was there a couple years ago. It's a beautiful little spot, and you can walk out onto this nearly private beach. There was no one there when I was there. So if you ever have the chance to go down to Long Beach or Seaview, you might stop and take that uh, gentle, flat little walk out onto the beach. Another dramatic view uh, about the Cascade Locks on the Columbia River. We, they were trying to get around uh, the Cascades of the Columbia so they could bring boats farther upstream. The first appropriation made by Congress to build these locks was in 1876 when $90,000 was voted to begin the great task. Nearly every year money has been voted for this purpose, the total amount to date being over $1.1 million. The plan of improvement adopted by the engineers was to flank the upper Cascades with a canal 3,000 feet in length and to render the remainder of the channel navigable by clearing out the islands, boulders, rocky points, and submerged reefs by blasting. The canal under construction is 3,000 feet long and 90 feet wide, and the work is so far progressed that with an ample appropriation, it could be speedily brought to a conclusion. The hops of the Yakima Valley are pronounced to be the best on the Pacific coast, not even accepting those of the famous Puyallup Valley. The yield per acre is enormous, averaging 2,000 pounds. This engraving is from a sketch made in one of the yards near the city and includes the residences of four of the leading hop raisers of the valley. It is a truthful representation and conveys a better idea of the luxuriant growth of the vines than could be done otherwise. The hops are picked by Indians who have proved themselves to be better and more reliable than either Chinese or white men. Fully 1,500 bales were harvested this season, and during the year, about 100 acres of new vines were set out. This is Bukota, or Siatko, as, as it was known for some time. On the line of the Northern Pacific Railway, 40 miles south of Tacoma and 100 miles north of Portland, is the thrifty town of Bukota. It has a population of about 1,000 and is soon to be incorporated. The chief manufacturing industry at this point has been the sawmilling interest, the Seattle Manufacturing Company employs 150 men. They have a most complete establishment, including sawmill and sash, door, and blind factory. They also employ 100 men in their five logging camps. Bucota, and listen to this carefully and compare it to what Bucota has today. Bucota has one enterprising newspaper, five stores of general merchandise, one meat market, one furniture store, one shoe shop, one cigar and confectionery store, a blacksmith shop, and two barber shops. Plans are drawn for a hotel, a bank is being constructed, and a large hall will soon be completed. So in those days, uh, Bucota was a pretty much going concern. Now from the little to the big, town-wise anyway, in September 1888, there was formally presented to the citizens of Portland the first public drinking fountain erected in the city, but which, let us hope, will not long be the only one. Stephen G. Skidmore is the one to whom we owe this beautiful, useful, and lasting ornament. His estate of $162,000 was disposed of by will, including a specific bequest of $5,000 for a public fountain. The fountain is placed at the intersection of First Street with A and Vine Streets and occupies a circular area 23 feet in diameter, the solid granite basin being octagonal with four exterior stone watering troughs. The stone used is dressed granite from the Franklin quarries of Maine. The troughs are supplied with water by streams flowing from the fountain through miniature lion heads to four of which metal drinking cups are attached by chains. And I believe that fountain is still there. Is it not at uh, the at the end of one of the bridges? I think the new Presbyterian Church in Portland is being constructed on the southwest corner of Tenth and Alder Streets. In exterior dimensions, it is 140 by 85 feet, the spire reaching a height of 185 feet, and being so massive in its composition as to contain stones weighing three and a half tons at a height of 75 feet from the ground. The style of architecture is Gothic, and the material used is stone from the St. Helens quarries with trimmings of Bellingham Bay bluestone. The main auditorium has a height of 57 feet and has a seating capacity of 730. 
The glass work will be very ornamental, ornamental, the stained glass now being manufactured in Portland by Povey Brothers, late of St. Louis, who have recently founded this industry here. The Yakima country is capable of growing successfully a remarkable range of vegetable products. Besides the ordinary grains, fruits, and vegetables which are common to most of the Pacific Slope, corn and tobacco are grown to perfection, sorghum is an excellent crop, and even a fine quality of cotton has been raised. Tobacco has proved so successful during the three or four years when considerable attention was devoted to its culture that it is now reckoned among the safest and surest and one of the most profitable for the producer, and cigar factories are being attracted by the superior quality of the product. Okay, here's one you recognize. Um, in 1889, the featured city in this issue of the West Shore was Olympia, and Tumwater got a few digs in there too, uh, but primarily, primarily Olympia. And there uh, were many pages of text describing Olympia, and I just picked out a little snippet that I thought was rather interesting, and maybe something you haven't heard before, but this is what the writer thought of Olympia at the time. At Olympia, business is conducted on the slow-going plan of our British cousins. To a stranger or occasional visitor standing on the street corner, the conclusion is reached that everyone is employed by the government at liberal salary to fill every position. There is no rush, nor hurry, nor bustle. Everybody seems to be provided for life in advance and to be thoroughly conversant with that soothing fact. Business houses open late and close early. After selling you an article of merchandise, the easygoing independent storekeeper or clerk never asks you, is there anything else today? He just assumes you can come back tomorrow or ask for it yourself. Notwithstanding the apparent indifference to the outside world and its absence of energy, Olympia is the most beautiful and perhaps the most desirable place of residence on the Sound. Its people are noted everywhere for open-handed hospitality and friendship. Now, up to this time, the West Shore had been a monthly magazine, appearing 12 times a year, except for one year when the De November and December issues were not published because Samuel himself was on a big trip back east gathering more material. But other than that, it was monthly magazine. Uh, by April 5th, of, or I'm sorry, September of 89, though, Samuel had changed it to a weekly format. Um, still, uh, roughly the same number of pages and over the years, the size of the magazine varied from 16 to 32 pages, and sometimes during special issues, they went up to 40 or 44 or even more pages per issue. Um, but the weekly issues were 16 to 20 pages, roughly. And this, I thought, was one of the prettiest covers, an Easter cover. And uh, during the later years, most of the illustrations, not all, but most of the bigger ones anyway, were in full color. So they got pretty graphic. And this, I think, is a really beautiful one. Again, this was a center fold. You can see the little string in the, uh, the fold down the center. Union Depot. Does anyone know why these depots were called Union Depot? Portland had a Union Depot. Seattle, Tacoma, they all had Union Depots. Anybody know why? Union Pardon? Union Pacific Railroad. Good guess, but wrong. Yes, they were combining railroads. Uh, towns got tired of having a Union Pacific Depot over here and a Northern Pacific Depot over there, and cities and towns, government, really got together and um, encouraged, <laughs> if that's uh, not a strong enough word, the different railroad lines to get together and create one common depot, so they had one hub of transportation, and they were called union depots because it was a union of all the different railroads that came into a particular city, uh, as it was Portland's. In the center of this number of the magazine is given an engraving of the Grand Union Depot now being constructed in Portland by the Northern Pacific Terminal Company for the occupancy of the Union Pacific, Northern Pacific, and Southern Pacific Railroads. The main building will contain a general waiting room two full stories in height, ladies waiting and toilet rooms, smoking room and toilet room for gentlemen, barber shop, immigrants room with toilet rooms for both sexes, dining room, lunch room, kitchen, etc. At the north end of the building will be placed the general baggage room, express room, mail room, Pullman supplies, etc. 
It will also be provided with newsrooms, parcel and package checks rooms, etc. And it is intended that for convenience both to the public and the railroad companies, the depot shall be second to none in the country. And of course, this depot is still there too, or the bulk of it is. And it still has that same diagonal approach. This was another uh, political cartoon or uh, social commentary drawn by Clarence Smith. And I threw this one up there just because since we're in the middle of a census again, I thought this one was rather timely. In those days, in 1890, as they were taking the census, some people thought that there were certain aspects of the population that were being overlooked. Apparently in those days, you can see on the sign, they called it a senseless ruling because uh, only the residential portions of the city were enumerated. And if someone lived in a business district, as so many people do now and probably did back then, they weren't even counted. So there was a, a good deal of the population that went unaccounted for. Uh, this is from, well, two different issues. And these are not, this drawing was not made from this photograph. These are years apart. But I wanted to put this up just to show you what I feel is the charm and the detail that was often available in the drawn illustrations as opposed to the photographs. Now, granted, this photograph was taken from a microfilm copy, so it's pretty fuzzy. But still, I think the illustrators, being artists, were able to pick out and accentuate details that sometimes did not show up in photographs. Mm -hmm. So when the magazine started to move away from uh, the lithographs and in, on into photographs, I think that they, they lost a lot of the charm of their magazine. And indeed, it was in uh, the February 7th, 1891 issue that a rather startling announcement was made on the first page. With the issue of January 31st, 1891, Mr. L. Samuel retired from the management of the West Shore and from the West Shore Publishing Company and is no longer connected with either. The new management of the West Shore is arranging for extensive improvements in the paper. A few weeks ago, the opinions of patrons regarding the treatment of features of public interest was asked in this column. In response to this invitation, it develops that colored lithographic illustrations are not the most popular for a journal of this class. So the changes to be made will include the superseding of that style with illustrations made by photomechanical means. We are confident that these improvements will appeal strongly to popular favor. Well, apparently not so, because three months later, this was the last issue of the West Shore. Um, I don't really know why they went out of business. Uh, perhaps it was because photomechanical means of reproducing photographs were more popular and even newspapers like the Oregonian, which was, had long been ex in existence, could compete with monthly or weekly magazines as far as illustrating the news and, uh, and events and places. But um, the magazine did only survive by about three or four months. Samuel's leaving the magazine. Thank you all for coming and enjoy your little souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs>